Hi everyone, and welcome to section 1.3. Remember that in 1.2 we explored a couple of the different properties of integrals, and we found that in general actually computing an integral of a function is really hard. You either have to know something about the geometry of the situation, which is very particular, and you kind of end up just hoping that you can break things up into some rectangles and some circles and some triangles. Uh, or you have to do this really nasty limit procedure and you have to know something about f uh, formulas for complicated sums. So we're hoping to really avoid all of those difficulties. And in order to do that is uh, we have the, the fundamental theorem of calculus to help us out. So let's take a look at what this theorem says and we will then see how we can use it in order to actually make computing integrals much, much easier. So we're going to start off with the statement of, of what, what it says and how it can be helpful. So uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, if f of x is a continuous function on a, b, and a of x is an antiderivative of f of x, then we can conclude that the integral from a to b of f of x dx is going to be equal to uh, a of b minus a of a. Now there are certainly a couple of questions that arise here. Namely, what is an antiderivative? That's certainly uh, not a word that we've seen before. So let's go ahead and define it. It is going to be kind of what you think it should mean, anti meaning opposite, and uh, so it's going to be the opposite of a derivative, and we're going to be working on reversing the process of, der of taking derivatives that we did last term. So to define this word really fast, uh, if f of x is a function, then an antiderivative of f of x is a function a of x, so that a prime of x equals f of x. In other words, it's some function whose derivative is f. So going back to our fundamental theorem of calculus here, if we want to compute this thing, if we want to compute this integral from a to b of f of x dx, then what we can do is we can first try to find a function whose derivative is the integrand. And once we've found that function, we're going to evaluate it at the top endpoint, evaluate it at the bottom endpoint, and then subtract the two. So let's uh, let's think about antiderivatives briefly uh, in a, for, for a moment, and then we will actually apply this fundamental theorem of calculus to compute an integral. So starting off, we have example one, which is asking us, what are the derivatives of x cubed over three and x cubed over three plus one? And what does this say about antiderivatives? So a little open-ended, but we can do the, the first part pretty uh, straightforward. So let's see, so it's asking us for the derivative of x cubed over three, well, great. Uh, we know that that one third there is a constant multiple, so it can factor out of the integral, or out of the derivative. Uh, sorry about that. So um, our constant multiple rule says this is one third times the derivative of x cubed. And then uh, the derivative of x cubed, we can apply our power rule to that. Uh, our power rule says take that exponent of 3 and bring it down and then reduce the exponent by one. So the derivative of x cubed there is three x squared. And simplifying things a little bit, we get x squared. So we can cancel out those threes. All right, so hopefully a little bit of review of, of our power rule and constant multiple rules. Uh, we have one more maybe rule that we want to throw in the mix here as we're remembering how to do derivatives. So we want, also want to compute the derivative of x cubed over 3 plus 1. Remember that derivatives, uh, when you're taking the derivative of a sum, you can take the derivative of both pieces. So in this case, I'm taking the derivative of x cubed over 3 plus 1. And so that tells me that I can just take the derivative of x cubed over 3 and take the derivative of 1 and add them. This is not always the case. Certainly with products, I need to apply my product rule. Um, but for the moment, uh, at least with, with sums, these are relatively straightforward. I can just take the derivative of x cubed over 3 and add it to the derivative of 1. 
Now, we just got finished computing the derivative of x cubed over 3, this first part here, and we found that it was x squared. And one thing to remember uh, when we're computing the derivative of a constant, you can either just remember derivative of a constant is 0, uh, or you could remember that, for instance, uh, a constant function is a horizontal line, and it has slope 0, so since derivative means slope, uh, the derivative of a constant is 0. However you want to remember it, it is up to you. Uh, but anyways, this ends up being x squared plus 0, which is x squared. So notice here that these two functions have the same derivative. They both uh, have the derivative being x squared. So what exactly does that mean? So that means that um, x cubed over 3 and x cubed over 3 plus 1 are antiderivatives, antiderivatives of x squared. This is because we said an antiderivative of some function is another function whose derivative is the thing you started with. So in this case, I'm starting with x squared, and I'm asking for functions whose derivatives are x squared. Uh, I find that both x cubed over 3 and x cubed over 3 plus 1 are those antiderivatives. So what exactly does this say about antiderivatives? Well, I've got one function here, but it has two different antiderivatives. In other words, antiderivatives are not unique. There are multiple of them, at least in some cases. So let's go ahead and write down that lesson. Antiderivatives are not unique. Cool. All right. So we'll try to keep that in mind. And maybe this uh, brings up a question of up here in the fundamental theorem of calculus. I said that uh, this area here is, um, uh, and it, I said that this integral, if we want to compute it, you just find an antiderivative and you evaluate and you do this subtraction. So there's a question of, well, does it matter which antiderivative that I pick? So we'll, we'll try it with our two examples here. We'll find out later that it doesn't matter in general, um, but we'll just sort of see what, it happen, what happens as we're, as we're computing this integral. So for example two, we have an integral that we saw uh, in section 1.2. So this is the integral from zero to two of x squared dx. And we're going to uh, apply the fundamental theorem of calculus which we often abbreviate FTC. And we're going to say, well, what I can do is I can find an antiderivative of x squared. So let's, let's pick our favorite antiderivative, x cubed over 3 to start. And then what I want to do is I want to evaluate this at 2, evaluate this at 0, and subtract. And the way that we're going to use this notation here, or the way that we're going to write this down, is we're going to use a vertical bar. So this isn't a 1, this is really just a, a, or a vertical line. And we're going to write the lower bound, uh, the lower limit of integration on the bottom. So this 0 here is going to uh, give us that 0 there. And we're also going to write the upper limit of integration, or the upper limit of integration on the top there. So uh, we're going to put that 2. And then what this notation means is it means take the function that we've written down, this x cubed over 3, evaluate it at 2, so we're looking at 2 cubed over 3, and subtract, oh, my apologies, 2, uh, we're evaluating it to, oh yeah, no, that was right, 2 cubed over 3, uh, and subtract away the function, again, x cubed over 3, evaluate it at 0, so minus 0 cubed over 3. So I've taken some antiderivative, x cubed over 3, and I've evaluated it at one endpoint, evaluated it at the other endpoint, and subtracted. And if I actually do this subtraction, uh, I get 2 cubed is 8. So I'm left with 8 thirds for the first term. 0 cubed is 0. Divide by 3 is 0 for the second term. So we just are left with 8 thirds. Now, if you compare what we just did uh, here to what we did in section 1.2, you certainly see that this is a much simpler process for actually computing these integrals. Um, in section 1.2, we used this crazy limit with a crazy sum, and that, that required a lot of work. 
Here we just said, well, what function has derivative equal to x squared? And let's plug in some numbers to that and do some subtraction. So certainly this fundamental theorem of calculus is a pretty big help. So we have another question that we want to answer, which is, does it matter which antiderivative that we chose? And so let's see what would happen if we picked the other antiderivative that we found. So the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, says, pick your favorite antiderivative. So let's pick x cubed over three plus one this time. We're gonna take this function and evaluate it from zero to two. So uh, evaluating at two gives me two cubed over three plus one. Evaluating at zero gives me zero cubed over three plus one. And notice that uh, I still get this eight over three from my two cubed over three term. And I get, uh, I have a plus one here, but now I have a minus one coming from the fact that I'm subtracting away the function evaluated at zero. So I have that plus one and I have a minus one and that also gives me eight thirds. So we see here that whether we pick uh, x cubed plus one or whether we pick x cubed or x cubed over three plus one or x cubed over three, both of those antiderivatives give me the same answer for the integral here, which is good. All right, one more example here. We're going to compute the integral from minus one to 35 of 101 x to the 100 dx. So our fundamental theorem of calculus says, find a function whose derivative is 101 x to the 100. So let's uh, think about that. Well, uh, certainly x to the 101 fits the bill. If I were to take the derivative of x to the 101, I'd bring down the exponent to put a 101 out front, and then I would reduce the exponent by one, giving me a 100 in the exponent. So in fact, uh, x to the 101 is an antiderivative of uh, 101 x to the 100. And the fundamental theorem of calculus says evaluate from minus 1 to 35. And so this is going to be 35 to the 101 minus, uh, minus 1 to the 101. Uh, not sure if you can plug these numbers into your calculator, um, but if you could, you could get some number out. It would be very large. In any case, again, this should sort of emphasize how much easier this fundamental theorem of calculus is making our lives. When we wanted to compute, uh, if we had wanted to attempt to do this using some kind of uh, Riemann sum and taking a limit of that, we would end up hopelessly uh, overwhelmed with trying to figure out what the sum of powers of like the 100th powers of something is. Um, so again, uh, fundamental theorem of calculus making our life a little bit easier here. So the last thing that I want to do in this uh, first video is, is give you some intuition about what's going on here. In some sense, what we're saying is, uh, what we, or what we notice here is um, we are taking an integral of something which is pretty apparently the derivative of something we're familiar with. Um, we know that 101x to the 100 is the derivative of, of x to the 101. So I'm going to put this in quotes because, again, this isn't uh, true or, or mathematically formal in any sense. Um, but if we're taking the integral of some derivative, um, then somehow we're getting something out about the original function. So here what we had was uh, this was the derivative of, um, one o of x to the 101. And we integrated it, and we got some information back about x to the 101 itself. So it's almost like if we take the integral of a derivative, we get something back about the original function. The next question that we're going to want to answer is what if we reverse the process? What if we take the derivative of some integral? So we'll need to do a little bit of setup in order to talk about what that means. But for the moment, we'll understand that the first part of this fundamental theorem of calculus is telling us uh, that if you first take a derivative, and then take an integral of that thing, you get something about the original function back. 